Welcome to the Wanda Learn Podcast. It's Francis Tapon. I'm here with Jennifer Pedum. You made this amazing, probably one of the most amazing documentaries I've seen, and it's simply called Mountain. And I saw it when I was surfing through Netflix, and they, they recommended it, and I was just blown away. So I said, I must talk to Jennifer and find out how she went about making this amazing documentary. I really recommend it. Uh, tell us quickly about like what's the documentary about? I mean, it's mountain and it's pretty much a great title because that's pretty much what it's about. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a movie that explores, I think, the human fascination to mountains. Um, you know, what is it that, that causes some of us to risk our lives for this thing that can't really love us back? So um, it, was, it was an interesting gestation, the project. It actually came to me um, as an idea from the Australian Chamber Orchestra, who are one of the greatest chamber orchestras in the world. And they are known for these really unusual collaborations. And they had, had done a surf movie, actually. And um, they had seen some of my films and, and, um, and asked me to collaborate on a project about mountains. So the idea actually came from them. But in my history, I had, of course, spent quite a lot of time in the mountains. So I had worked as a climbing camera operator on Everest expeditions, and I'd, I'd made quite a few films in the adventure space before. Um, and so I guess it was just a good fit. And, um, and so the project is therefore very driven by music because it actually began life as a concert piece. Um, and at a certain point in, in that process, the creative development process, I decided that, you know, I, I, I'm a filmmaker, so I wanted to make a film. And so we kind of then had two aims. It was to have this extraordinary performance piece. Um, so the orchestra performs live to the, to, the, to the movie, but it's not like a, you know, Star Wars with the London Symphony playing to it. it it's, it's very much designed as a concert. So it's, it's very different to anything I had made before. It's very different to most documentaries because it's a little bit like going to a concert, actually. So the music is very front and centre. The cinematography is, is very front and centre. And, and then we have this very sparse um, narration um, that kind of ties all of the ideas together. And it's, um, it's written by a wonderful um, British writer called Robert McFarlane. Um, and yes. he, he wrote this book called Mountains of the Mind, which is, um, you know, one of the great books when I was climbing, when I was, you know, in my 20s and I was climbing a lot, that was a book that was a really important inspirational book for me because it kind of helped explain that birch, you know, what is it that fascinates us about mountains? What is it that draws us to mountains? And his book sort of explores that, um, what he calls a revolution of perception. So how is it that, you know, only 200 years ago, we feared mountains and believed that they were the domains of gods and monsters. And yet here we are now with this totally different relationship. So his book explores that. And, and so in many ways that became the arc for the film. Um, and then of course we had to find an, an amazing voice to narrate that. And, and one of my favorite actors is, um, is Willem Dafoe. And so we asked him to do it. And, and so he became the voice of the movie and he has this wonderful craggy voice, but he very much, I think, um, liked the ideas that we were expressing in the film. So that's how it, it all came together. It's a fantastic, you're bringing those three elements together so beautifully, the writing, the cinematography and the music just merge uh, so brilliantly. Now you picked uh, Defoe, William Defoe, as a writer. One thing that always fascinates me about Hollywood is when they're moving, when they're making movies like Toy Story, or you're just doing a documentary. Why is it so important to capture to get these kind of well-known stars like a Tom Hanks or somebody like that to narrate when you don't even see their face? It seems like you could get some voiceover actor who's got an amazing voice. Uh, and yet we need these people that, that are actors who are known for their visual face as well. Why, why is that so important? Why can't we just um, save some money? I mean, because I imagine Defoe is not cheap. And so you probably... Well, you know, he was very generous and he was very generous, actually. Um, it's partly it's marketing, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it's partly there's something about like when you choose an actor like that, you know, their body of work embodies a lot of ideas right so Willem Dafoe is an actor that if you think about his career he's taken a lot of risks he's done big mainstream movies but he survived as an independent um, filmmaker as well like so he's 
he crosses over, he, he works with really interesting, challenging directors. And that to me was really important because this is a film about risk taking, about why we take these risks. And I think I needed the, whoever it was to deeply understand that idea. So there was, I think that's, it's kind of like good casting, you know, they say in movie making, casting is everything. Okay, casting is 80%, you know? Um, and so it is, it is true and it's, it's, it's one of those things that's hard to grab hold of, but um, they're important choices. And, you know, we, we were kind of on some voices.com thing, listening to a bunch of voices and just nothing, I didn't believe it, you know? And there's a reason that these actors are very successful because they can do something, they can really make magic. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. But no, that it was... did. That definitely did. Now, you talked about how that 80% rule, that applies, I think, to fiction movies. But when you're dealing with a documentary, 80% is not casting, right? Because you're not really casting anybody. No, and, and in this film even more, because as you know from seeing it, there are no characters. I mean, there right. are some characters that we never get to know them, we never hear them speak, except for one exception where there's a climber in real pain and he, he begs to be taken home. Right. Um, that's about the only piece of dialogue in the movie. And we so, don't even know who that climber is, I don't think. That's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know who he is, but... Um, right. but, but it's not, he's no, not identified, right. The audience doesn't know. And, and so we had an even harder job because, I mean, when I think about my other films, so for example, Sherpa, you know, in, I think some one of the reasons that feature docs are doing so incredibly well now at the box office is that, you know, non-fiction filmmakers are realising that in non-fiction too, casting is everything. Hmm. You know, characters are so important. And I think I'm very much a filmmaker that believes in those rules of, you know, story and structure and um, character arcs. Um, and I, I do that in my non-fiction filmmaking. In a film like this, it was so much harder because the mountains were the characters. Right. And so the mountains themselves needed to have an arc. Um, and in the end, that became our relationship with the mountains and, um, and how that's changed over time and where it sits now and if we listen, what mountains can teach us and those kinds of things. So it was a really hard film to make in that respect because you didn't have all the normal tools at your disposal. Right. So, Jennifer, you had your one of your partners in the process was Renan Ozturk, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He was a he had about 17 hours worth of beautiful mountain footage or more that he kind of said, yeah. OK, here's a body of work. Uh, we can edit this. And then you what, my question is, what percentage of the mountain movie was Renan's footage that he brought to the table what percentage that you grabbed from elsewhere for example there was one moment there i see alex honnold who's on half dome and he's kind of standing on the edge i don't think either one of you filmed That's, that i could be wrong yeah, no, Renan, no Renan filmed that okay great okay great yeah, so yeah, maybe yeah. but maybe there's it's about, 60, it's about 60 percent renan's footage okay and then there's about another fairly large percentage um so that was footage that either renan and i shot together um, we shot together in the Himalayas. Um, it was stuff that he had already sh um, already shot um, and was sitting there, had been used a tiny bit, might have been used for another project, but most of it had never been seen before. Um, and there were some instances, for example, that Highline Walker in, in Yosem uh, not Yosemite, in um, Utah, um, you know, that that was shot during the making of the film. He said, listen, is this something you're interested in? And, and um, of course I was, so he went and shot it. So mm -hmm. there was there was that. So we kind of had a variety of different ways of working together. See, Renan spends most of his life on expeditions and he shoots his expeditions and then has got little time to make films about it because he's on the next expedition or on a climbing job. And so he had this incredible library of footage that just wasn't being used. And I got to know him on Sherpa. So he was my cinematographer on Sherpa. Nice. And I knew about this project then. And so we spent a lot of time at base camp talking about it. And he was really interested in, in the ideas that it was exploring, but also that it was a collaboration with an orchestra. So hmm. he had grown up, um, his mother was a classical flaut, um, flute player, flautist. Hmm. And, um, so he was really interested just in what we were trying to achieve with a film like this, that, that it be designed as a live performance piece, but also work as a standalone movie. Um, so that's how he came to be involved. 
And then there were some other guys, um, a really amazing Canadian outfit called Sherpa's Cinema. So you'd see them in the credits as well, in the, in the opening credits. Um, they, he, Renan frequently collaborates with them and I'd seen a lot of their work and loved it. Okay. And so he made an introduction to those guys. Same thing for them. They shoot a lot of commercial work. They do a lot of the amazing skiing stuff, um, snowboarding stuff. So whereas Renan's more climbing, they're more skiing, snowboarding, lots of helicopters, amazing work, amazing, amazing work. And they, they shoot lots of beautiful visual metaphors. And so Renan introduced me to those guys. And so I, um, you know, then set up a similar relationship. They allowed me into their, I went up to Whistler in Canada and sat in their, their production office on their edit suites for days and days and just pulled down footage that we wanted to use. Again, a lot of which had never been used. So we got the rushes, as you call them, from these shoots. Um, and if they had been used before, they hadn't been used in this way, not with right. this music. Um, right. So it was... How, um, how, but I have a question... You know, how is it that you distill, this is the challenge for me is I'm trying to grasp, because I know how it's like to have like a hundred hours of footage and you got to squeeze it down into just a one or two hour documentary. We how had a thousand, thousand hours of footage. Even worse, yeah. right? <laughs> so all the more, you're just making my point. How, what is your process, your methodology, your way of thinking, Jennifer, that you distill this thousand hours down to an hour or two you need to find your structure you need to figure out what it is you're trying to say you need to what i say beat out but you need to really understand what's my first act what's happening in the second act and and what's the you know what is the third act how am i going to finish this thing and you you kind of write that and you you know so we were working with robert mcfarlane the writer figuring out the structure and then once you find the structure, you can start to say, okay, well, these images really represent that idea. Um, and these images, you know, like if we're looking at the human relationship to mountain, of course, so we needed black and white archive. We wanted to do a little section that kind of showed that transition and then brought us up to today. So it's about rather than just starting to whittle away, you, you have to think about story first then footage then so jennifer you tell me if i'm if i'm reading you right here you started off with this basically a rough script or maybe a very strong script where you got act one act two act three and you got a broad overview of the storyline part two you gather the footage and that that kind of works in with a storyline and part three is you integrate the music is that the sequence or does the music come before the the video or kind of at the same time or so no Sometimes the music comes first. You think, okay, this is a great piece of music. We're setting out. We want to send off our adventurers on their way. Okay, what music is going to work for that? You kind of have an idea of what kind of footage you're going to use. Then you might bring in the music. Other times, so sometimes the music led. Other times the music came right at the very end. I wanted to know about the marketing aspect of films. And this is kind of like all artists face this quandary. They, they're, they're obsessed about the art and the development of the art, but then they are disappointed when they realize that, my God, most of the real work is the marketing aspect and getting the word out. <laughs> um, and, and oftentimes artists are not good at doing that. So what did, you've done th at least three uh, major documentaries, Sherpa, Solo and Mountain. What did you learn from shooting that? And as far as marketing specifically, what has worked for you? What hasn't worked for you? Okay, well, the number one thing is to make a really good movie. Um, okay, because then people want to see it. And, and what I have discovered is word of mouth is the most powerful marketing tool. Um, so, you know, so it really comes with um, having a very careful festival strategy um, because the, depending on what festivals you get into, that can totally determine the success or otherwise of the project. Mm -hmm. So um, if you really manage the festival process well, and when you get to a certain level, there are people for that. So there are sales agents who, um, and agents that work really closely with you to make sure that you get into those A-list festivals. So for example, Sherpa, got into Telluride Film Festival and Toronto Film Festival, which really then gave it a really great kickstart to life, if you know what I mean. 
So um, Mountain had its world premiere because it was a very different concert, its world premiere, and because it had been commissioned by the Australian Chamber Orchestra, it began life as a concert at the Sydney Opera House in that magnificent building on the harbour there. Mm. So it was a, a very beautiful kind of um, massive event. Um, and then it went and did the international festivals. So it did San Sebastian and London and um, a host of a host of others. So having a sales agent then that can, you know, talk to people like Netflix, which is how you then saw the movie. So they do all of those deals for you and, and that kind of thing. And usually at a certain point with Sherpa, we were doing, um, you know, an awards run. So we got a BAFTA nomination in the end, um, not an Oscar one, unfortunately. But there are publicists that work with you. I mean, it's a huge amount of work. Um, and I, I find that really difficult, particularly with a film like Sherpa where, you know, people had died, Sherpas had died and... You know, here we were spending, you know, we could have spent, you can spend up to a million dollars marketing a film, a feature documentary for an Academy campaign, if not more, because the whole, um, the whole Academy now votes for feature doc. And so you can spend a lot, a lot of money. So you need, you know, you need very big backers to do that. And to be honest, that felt really uncomfortable to me with a film like Sherpa. Um, so we spent, we spent quite a lot of time with our Australian release doing a lot of fundraising and we've used that movie all over the world. We've allowed it to be screened at different um, community things where the people have raised money for the Sherpa community. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a quandary. If, you, if you're really going for those big awards, um, you need to pretty much put aside, you know, at least six to nine months of your life and just work full time on that, which is very difficult for a filmmaker who just wants to make films. <laughs> um, and keep in mind, you're not getting paid when you do that work. Right. So it's an investment in your career, but it's, it's not paid work. So you constantly on an airplane going somewhere. And, um, you know, I think with mountain, I've been overseas about seven times this year. I've got one more overseas trip to go. With Sherpa, it was about the same. It was just an insane amount of travel. Um, so, you know, that's tough. Um, but, you know, it's an investment in your career. So you just have to manage it carefully and know the ones to say yes to and know the ones to say no to. What would you say is a common mistake that a novice documentary filmmaker usually make and that they shouldn't make? I imagine marketing is one of them that they underestimate that they're going to have to spend seven months of their life after they finish the film to to do it. I think another one might be that they think that if they just get a distribution deal with Netflix or whatever, then they're done. They're like, yay, I'm finished. Yeah. I mean, I think in the end, it comes back to what I said at the beginning. If you make a really good film, people will gather around you to help you with that stuff because there's money to be made if you've made a good film. Um, you know, going right back to making the film in the first place, I think the error that I see a lot with people making documentary films is that they don't think it, about it as a movie to start with. They think about it as a documentary, whatever that means. And so they go into the field and they um, just shoot everything. And they don't necessarily know what the story is. See, with Sherpa, we were shooting the movie and in the middle of, which was to follow an Everest expedition from the Sherpa's point of view. And then the, an avalanche came and killed 16 Sherpas. And so obviously we had to pivot. But because we'd done so much thinking about, um, about story before, we were able to pivot. And so I think that's my advice is to watch other movies, watch other documentaries, um, but, but also movies and think, what is this kind of film? Is it a buddy movie? Is it a quest film? Is it a romantic comedy? You need to think about documentaries as movies as well as just being documentaries um, and know what, what, know what it is you're trying to say before you walk out the door and spend a whole lot of money on shooting something. Very good. How have you, Jennifer, evolved from your, you know, going from Sherpa, Solo and then Mountain? How have you changed as a documentary filmmaker? What have you really, uh, I guess, proud of, of having grown in a certain way? Um, I think I think probably the thing is that I've, I've really learnt to 
be a better storyteller, you know, mm. to really think clearly about planning my films, really understanding my own voice, understanding what it is that I want to say. The other part of it is becoming more ambitious. You know, as people grow in confidence, then you can afford bigger crews, more cameras, more time in the edit, all of those things, better music. And so you just evolve in that way, but you have to start small. Um, well, you don't necessarily need to start small. You could, you know, some people make a brilliant movie, their first movie. Um, for me, it's been just doing work. It's just been working on a lot of projects. Um, I've done, as you said, pretty big feed docs, but I haven't, I've done a lot of television. Um, so I've spent a lot of time being a filmmaker. I've learned to become a very good interviewer, um, very good listener. Um, and then I've just learned to really get good at story, I think, is, is the thing that I'm still practicing, you know. When you say good interviewer, what specifically, like, have you improved in your interviewing technique? When you're saying good listener, obviously you want to be a good listener, but any specific tips that you could help people become better at at uh, interviewing other people and listening better? Yeah, I mean, the number one golden rule in documentary is if you're not going to be in the movie yourself is that you have to learn to respond with your face because you can't talk over people. So in a normal conversation, you and I go, oh, yeah, yeah, and you cross over like this, but you can't do that if you don't want to be in the movie. And I'm always surprised when I see young filmmakers, they're going, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And so you can't use any of it because it's, um, they're talking all over the top of it and they answer the questions for the people or they, you know, or they don't listen to the answer and they read their questions. So sitting there and the person is looking at the top of their head while they're reading their next question. That is kryptonite. You know, you can't do that. You have to... I plan my interviews very well. I write them down. I structure them. I understand how that particular person fits into the story, exactly what I need to get out of the interview. I plan it. I write every single question. And then when it comes to being in the interview, I don't look at it once. So I might have an iPad on my lap and it's all about eye contact. So you absolutely. And so then if, if somebody says something unexpected, you don't need to go to the next question on your list. You go, oh, wow, let's go this way. And, and that's happened to me. So if you're ready for it, if you're planned and you're really prepared and you understand what this person means to the film and what role they're playing in the film, then, you know, you've cast them, then, you know, you can, you can then just intuitively know and follow the interview in the direction it goes. And then at a certain point when you feel like you're done, you can look down at your questions and go, oh, I forgot this one, you know. But I think that would be the big thing is to learn the interview, understand what the character is doing in the film. Then you don't need to sit there and read your questions. What's next for Jennifer Peter? Um, I have lots of... Um, I'm doing this um, fun little commercial project at the moment. I'm doing a little bit of advertising commercial work and I've also got two features uh, in development, not documentaries but dramas. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of you know, looking to make that transition. I mean, I think my first love will always be feature documentary, but I think I'm finding that you, you, you can be limited by the genre. So I'm trying to break down those barriers and, and work across genres a little bit more. So yeah, it's good fun. How can somebody who's, let's say, listening to this or watching this, uh, how can they help make Mountain a success? I mean, it feels like when I watch it on Netflix, I'm not really doing anything for you, but maybe you're getting like, 10 cents. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. They, yeah, look, I think the better it does on Netflix, the more likely they are to buy the next one. We're talking about a sequel, actually. We're talking about a movie called River. Um, and, you know, look, it's all good. I think it's just a, it's a fun movie to watch. It's a really different kind of film. It's kind of not even really a documentary. It's like a concert movie in a weird kind of way with a lot of thrill-seeking and adventure and some incredible footage and people doing insane things. Um, but it also has a really powerful message about, you know, the environment and, and humility and um, things like that. So I would just, you know, encourage people to watch it. And um, I think my other movie, Sherpa, is, um, I think it, maybe it's on Amazon or something. I'm not quite sure in the States. I don't think it's on Netflix um, because it was a Discovery Channel acquisition. Um, but, you know, watch the film, enjoy it. And um, that's, yeah. But so when, when Netflix actually does a deal with you, 
they just give you a flat fee. They don't give you per view any kind of stream. It's like it does very well. They just give you a flat fee. Flat fee. Okay. But we'd already done like a theatrical release in the United States mm -hmm. that had been in cinemas. We've been in cinemas all over the world. So this was now its online life. Um, in Australia, I think it's on iTunes, not Netflix because of the deals. But most of the world, it's on Netflix now. So mm -hmm. it's done the cinema and now it's doing its second phase of life. Wow, that's exciting. No, but it's a fantastic movie. I really uh, was amazed by it. And I think for the beginning, I mean, it's it's kind of a, a movie that is it's kind of at the beginning, kind of nice and slow. You kind of sink into it with the music and everything like that, as opposed to kind of like this hard, fast fitting. The fastest part of the movie, which is probably like the snowboard skiing section, you kind of place that in the middle. So kind of like instead of shooting for a crescendo there, you kind of place that that fast section in the middle, I would say. I mean, that was strategic, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, that was all part of the structure of the thing, you know, because mm. you have to set up the big idea at the beginning. Um, and also we wanted to really set a tone with this film that it was not, you know, watching a, no a normal film. You know, this is a film that's a collaboration with an orchestra. And yeah. so, you know, you, we wanted people to sink into it and then ramp things up um, yeah. and take them on a really exciting ride. You did a brilliant job. Uh, congratulations to you and your whole crew. You guys, A plus job. I, uh, I I highly recommend everybody to go out and see it. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your time, and I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. We are, you're a filmmaker to watch. Thank you so much. Okay.